Hi, this is Mr. Philippic again, and today we're going to be talking about cell respiration and how is it that we get energy from food. Uh, most commonly, most people think that cell respiration only happens in animals, but I'm here to tell you it happens in both animals and plants. So whether you're Sid the squirrel here or Daisy the daffodil, uh, the idea is, is that both of these organisms, plants and animals, have mitochondria which as you remember from our cell review is the powerhouse of the cell and if we take our mitochondria and we kind of lop the top off uh, you kind of see that the mitochondria has an outer membrane and then it has this folded inner membrane and the reason for this folded uh, inner membrane is to allow a greater surface area uh, for cell respiration to occur and uh, as we get into this, you're going to see we're going to be able to exchange electrons and protons across this inner membrane um, in order to complete cell respiration. Obviously, food is required, and that food that we know of is called glucose. And it could be really any sugar, whether it be fructose, it could even be sucrose, which our body will break down, or lactose that we find in milk. Um, and then this glucose is broken down into energy. And that energy, as you know, is ATP. And just a quick little review, I'll give you a second. What does ATP stand for? That's right. Hopefully you said adenosine triphosphate. And remember, uh, with adenosine triphosphate, if I draw a quick little uh, basic diagram of it, it's uh, adenosine, which is represented by this box, and then three phosphate groups. And if you remember, all the energy for this molecule is stored in this bond between these phosphate groups. And when we cleave off one of these phosphates to form ADP, uh, release buckets and buckets of energy. Here's the general equation for cell respiration. Again, uh, oxygen, which we breathe in, uh, glucose, or any type of sugar that we eat, uh, is going to be broken down into carbon dioxide, water, and some energy and that energy as we know is ATP. If you remember when we talked about photosynthesis I think we just had the arrow go the opposite way. Instead of having ATP as the energy source I think we said it is light. And so if you see it here uh, we have a nice little cycle of life here or circle of life not to get all Lion King on you but circle of life whereas uh, what plants produce which they produce sugar and oxygen we turn around and ingest and produce carbon dioxide and water which plants use to kind of fuel photosynthesis. So in terms of cell respiration the reactants are oxygen and glucose and the products are carbon dioxide, water and ATP. Typically when we see a slide like this we're inclined to write everything we see on the screen but really what I want you to focus on is that cell respiration at its whole is nothing more than the breaking down of food in the presence of oxygen. And so without oxygen, we're not going to go through the full complement of cell respiration. Uh, we're going to undergo something called fermentation, which is covered in another video. Cell respiration, as we know it, has three parts. Uh, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, which is also sometimes referred to as a citric acid cycle, depending on the reading. And the third part is the electron transport chain. All three of these uh, processes uh, will help us take one molecule of glucose and yield buckets and buckets of ATP. What if I told you um, you're going to give me a dollar and in one way I'm going to give you two dollars back or if I give you a little bit of oxygen I can give you up to thirty six dollars back. Obviously we'd probably want to get uh, thirty six bucks back uh, and that's what cells want to do. They want to get the most bang for their buck in terms of glucose. Here you see glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of a cell. The other two, the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain, happen within the mitochondria. And so basically what happens is, is that glucose is broken down in glycolysis. And if you remember your root words, lysis means to break and glyco refers to sugars. And so what happens is, is that the energy from glycolysis is fed into both the Krebs cycle as well as the electron transport chain. All along the way, we're going to create ATP, but the most ATP we're going to get out of uh, this process comes from the electron transport chain. Here's this slide talking a little bit about the difference between anaerobic and aerobic. 
And hopefully, again, if we remember our root words, anaerobic means without oxygen, aerobic means with. Uh, the only process out of the three that can happen without oxygen, with or without oxygen present, is glycolysis. Uh, the other two, the citric acid or Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, require oxygen uh, to occur. And so this slide does a little review on what is glycolysis and where does it take place. Again, as we saw in that one slide, glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, which means it's outside the mitochondria. This process is anaerobic, so it doesn't require oxygen. And basically what it does is it's going to take glucose and then break it down in a series of reactions. And uh, this video is not going to go into what all those reactions are, but just understand we're going to start with glucose and then with something called pyruvic acid. And along the way, uh, we're also going to generate just a little bit of ATP um, to kind of uh, help fuel the cell's energy needs. And so uh, this slide is going to kind of take us through this breakdown of glucose. Again, glucose is a six-carbon molecule. And glycolysis actually has two phases. We're going to call one an energy investment phase, where we're going to have to use a little bit of energy. And then we're going to turn around and have the energy payoff phase, where we're going to yield uh, a lot more energy. And so we have to kind of kickstart the process. Glucose is just not going to break down on its own. So we're going to motivate it by bringing in a couple of ATPs. And when we do that, uh, glucose is going to change itself into two, uh, three carbon molecules. And so we're actually going to phosphorylate or stick a phosphate group uh, on the glucose, which is going to motivate it to kind of change its shape. And then we're going to take through another series of reactions, these two, three carbon molecules, and eventually convert them into pyruvate. And when we do that, uh, we're going to yield uh, four ATP. So if we invested two, and we get back four, we end up with a net of two ATP. Along with two molecules of pyruvic acid. Now this pyruvic acid is then going to be fed uh, into the Krebs cycle um, uh, if there is oxygen. Okay, And so uh, the slide just kind of goes through and talks a little bit about how we get a net gain, a net gain out of glycolysis of two ATP. And so now this pyruvic acid, which we generated in glycolysis, is going to be sent to the mitochondria. Uh, and so pyruvic acid goes through the membrane of the mitochondria through a transport protein. And then what happens is, is that it's changed into something called acetyl-CoA. And this is going to be the precursor molecule that's going to be fed into the citric acid cycle uh, in order to generate what we're going to call electron carriers. And uh, along the way, we're going to make some carbon dioxide, and we're going to get two more ATP. So we get two from glycolysis, and now two from the Krebs cycle. So, so far, we're up to a total of four ATP. And uh, this does require oxygen, so we consider the citric acid cycle uh, aerobic. And so here's what happens. Uh, we take pyruvic acid, and we kind of funnel it into the mitochondria. At that time, we're going to change it into something called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is then going to be fed into this cycle. It's basically just a circle. And it's going to be a series of reactions where acetyl-CoA is going to be combined with something called oxaloacetate. And uh, those two things combined form citrate. Citrate. C-I-T-R-A-T-E. And so citrate gets fed in, and then basically the rest of the Krebs cycle, the other seven steps, basically takes citrate and is going to break it back down into this oxaloacetate so it's ready to receive the next acetyl-CoA. And along the way, you see we have a release of carbon dioxide. We're going to get some NADHs, which is basically an electron satchel or carrier. We're going to generate one ATP per turn and then another electron carrier called FADH2. Uh, this NADH and FADH2 are going to be used a lot later in the process uh, in the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain happens in the inner membrane. Uh, it's going to take all these energized electrons, these carriers, NADH and FADH2, and generate buckets and buckets of ATP. It's going to yield a total of right around 32 to 34 ATP. And of course, this does require oxygen. So let's take a little closer look and see how the electron transport chain works. 
Electron transport chain is basically a series of proteins embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And electrons are going to be passed along, as you see in this diagram, from protein to protein. And the reason for that is, is we can't allow electrons to fall, to free fall and free energy. What happens if we do that is we get this explosive release of heat and energy. It would be like us bursting into a fiery phoenix. It would be great once on a cold night, but then that would be it. And so what happens is, is that these uh, proteins within the electron transport chain kind of guide the electrons down in free energy and slowly release energy. And so what happens is, is we get this big release of hydrogens. And uh, these hydrogen ions uh, basically create what we call a concentration gradient. And if you notice what was happening here earlier in the slide, is that the hydrogen ions then diffuse down their normal concentration gradient through a protein called ATP synthase. And this membrane protein is going to take ADP and stick a phosphate group on it to generate ATP. The final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain is oxygen. And these electrons move through the chain because oxygen is the most electronegative. It basically kind of pulls like a tug of war, these electrons through these proteins and then combines it with these H pluses that come through ATP synthase to form our good friend water. And uh, that's how we generate the water from cell respiration. And so to basically to review here, cell respiration, we have glucose through the process of glycolysis or glycolysis, glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvic acid. In the presence of oxygen, pyruvic acid will then uh, be fed into the mitochondria. As a result of glycolysis, we're going to generate 2 ATP. Pyruvic acid is changed into acetyl-CoA and then is fed into the citric acid cycle. And for every turn of the citric acid cycle, we're going to generate 1 ATP. But since we have 2 pyruvic acids, we're going to generate a total of 2 ATP per glucose molecule. Meanwhile, a product of the citric acid cycle is the release of carbon dioxide. This chemical energy, basically stored energy, think of the citric acid cycle like a wind-up toy. And that chemical energy is fed into that electron transport chain, which I just showed you, and we're going to get a net of 32 ATP from that process. So we get 32 ATP from the electron transport chain, 2 from citric acid, and 2 from glycolysis. So if we add that up, we get a total of about 36 total ATP. So for every single molecule of glucose that's fed into our body, we're going to generate 36 ATP. And our bodies break down and regenerate ATP at a rate of about 10 million a second. So I hope this is a nice review on cell respiration, and thanks for watching.